So I'm supposed to give you a big idea that's so big that it fits into 10 minutes. Uh, and I don't know exactly how to do that. You'll find that uh, Harvard faculty have a very difficult time speaking for less than 53 minutes, which is the length of our lectures. But my big idea for you today is that it matters where you are. That's what I want to talk about. I think we live in a society that pushes against this idea increasingly. Just take the idea of online education, which I know you're all familiar with. Uh, it makes it seem as though you could learn everything you want to know uh, just by watching a bunch of YouTube videos. But learning is a lot more than just imbibing information and teaching is a lot more than just pouring information into an empty vessel. Living a, a human life, a genuinely human life, and learning the way a human being does, it seems to me, means engaging with the place that you find yourself in, in a thoughtful way. So I want to tell you how being here at Harvard, in this place, has changed the way I teach and the way I think about the research that I do. I want to tell some stories. So I arrived at Harvard in 2006, coming up on 13 years ago. And the first thing I did was to buy a copy of the collected letters of William James. How many of you have heard of William James or know who William James is? OK. For those of you who don't know about William James, in a way, I'm, I'm jealous of you. The, the experience of learning about him is a delightful one, and I hope you'll do that. Buying these letters was the first effect that the university had on me. I hadn't been interested in William James before, but he played such an enormous role in the history of this institution that when I got here, I thought, boy, I better find out something about him. He was a great 19th century, 19th and early 20th century philosopher and psychologist, equally a philosopher and psychologist. In fact, he uh, founded, roughly, the discipline of psychology. So here at the university, the philosophy departments and the psychology department e claim him equally, although it's only the psychology department that has managed to build a big, ugly building and name it after him. So, <laughs> uh, But his salience seemed much more obvious to me. Uh, and he, it turns out he, he is sort of tied up with this place. He grew up in a building that's no longer here, but is just steps away from here. Well, the place of it is just steps away from here on Quincy Avenue, where the faculty building now is. And uh, he, he throughout, stayed here throughout the late 19th century and the early, 19th, early 20th century until he died in 1910. You might know of him if you know his brother, the famous American novelist Henry James. And the two of them had a sister, Alice James, who's mysterious and fascinating to me. Everybody who knows about her says that she was more talented than either of her brothers. But because of the injustices of American society then, and even to some extent now, uh, she didn't, didn't ever become as famous as they did. But in any case, this building, Memorial Hall, since it was built in 1878, when James was just starting his career here as a young faculty member. Uh, this building is a building that was around when he was here. And it's almost certain that at least one of you, maybe more, is currently sitting in a place that William James himself once sat. Now, I was interested in James because he was interested in what seems to me the deepest and most important question that we can think about. That's the very general question, what is it, what does it mean to be a human being? This is a question, of course, that all religions take, have a take on. It's a question that many sciences think about. Uh, psychology, of course, anthropology, sociology, artificial intelligence. But it's also a question that I think is at the foundation, even at the origin of the discipline of philosophy, which is the discipline that I now teach in. If you go all the way back to the 5th century BCE in Athens, Greece, you'll find the famous philosophers Socrates and Plato. And they were 
they were obsessed with this question, not only what is it to be a human being, but sort of relatedly and following from that, what does it mean to live a human life well? That seems to me an important question. And uh, the first century BCE Roman orator Cicero, who Professor Dench knows a lot about, uh, used to say that philosophy, because it's so obsessed with this fundamental question, is ultimately about the art of living. So I was interested in reading James's letters because I wanted to find out what he thought about the art of living. And he, uh, he thought about it a lot. And so I started reading his letters when I first got here. I started at the end of his life because, you know, old people, they know a lot about this kind of thing. And so I started reading letters and I found out that six months before James died, he'd taken a trip to France. And I found some letters that he had exchanged with a contemporary French philosopher, a famous French philosopher at the time, named Émile Boutroux. And the letters between James and Boutroux, they suggested that Boutroux had somehow obtained for James an item and sent it to James here in Cambridge. It was an item that James uh, referred to in the letters as the Pascal death mask. Now, Blaise Pascal is a 17th century French philosopher. I teach him regularly in my introductory existentialism course. And so I was interested to know what this death mask is. A death mask, of course, is a fascinating and bizarre object. It's an object that's taken from the face of a person who has just died, a sculptor will come along at the moment of death and fold wax onto the face of the person and gain a direct impression of their face moments after the spirit of life has left them. And somehow James had obtained a copy of the Pascal death mask and he reports that he, he found comfort in gazing at it in the evenings as the end of his life was approaching. He knew he was about to die. I found this bizarre and sort of gruesome, <laughs> as I am sure you do too, but also kind of fascinating. And I thought, boy, I want to know what happened to that death mask, because <laughs> James had it in 1910. That's a cue for my friend, Eric Johnson de Vaufre, who is the librarian in the Robbins Library here at Harvard. Uh, I started looking for this death mask. Uh, with the help of Eric, and we had trouble finding it. We did discover that James had left it in his will in 1911 to Robbins Library, the library that Eric is, uh, the philosophy department library where Eric is the librarian, but we couldn't find it. We searched everywhere. I even told the students in my existentialism class who had spent weeks reading Pascal, I said, if you can find it, automatic A in the class. <laughs> the school newspaper loved this. They wrote a whole story about it. But I really believed it. I thought, well, maybe it's hiding in a closet somewhere. Some student is going to open their, their sort of closet in their dorm room and discover this thing. Or maybe it's Emerson Hall was, was renovated in the 1960s. Maybe it's sort of behind a wall that didn't used to be there. Something like that. We searched. We discovered, with a lot of help from Eric, we discovered that it was probably destroyed about 50 years ago. But then an amazing thing happened. Eric called up the place where they have the original of this death mask in Paris. And he told them the story. And they said, uh, well, we do have one other copy which for an undisclosed amount of money, we could sell to you. <laughs> and so this mask here, which if you can't see it, here, now, now, the, now the technology comes, if you can't see it, uh, that's an image of it. This mask here is one of three copies of the original death mask of Blaise Pascal. It's now held in Robbins Library. And one of the things that's extraordinary to me as a teaching moment when I teach Pascal for several weeks and then at the end, 
I bring in this mask and the students come up and they look at it and they touch it. Not much, just a tiny bit, Eric. <laughs> you didn't hear that, Eric. <laughs> so they, they come up. There's something extraordinary that happens. There is something in, amazingly compelling about being before the mask that's taken from the mold of the person who died 350 years ago, whose work you've been reading and thinking about for weeks, and, there's, and knowing that this was so important for the philosopher William James, who was here, who was so important to us, whose work engages with Pascal's work and so on. It's, it's fascinating, and, I, and it's helped me to change my understanding, although I still don't know entirely what my understanding is. It's helped me to change my understanding of what James meant when he said he got comfort from contemplating, gazing at this mask uh, towards the end of his life. I want to tell you one other story that's related to James. He, uh, retired, he died in 1910. Uh, he retired in 1907. In 1905, the building that the philosophy department is in now was built. We call it Emerson Hall after the early 19th century uh, American philosopher Ralph Waldo Emerson. And there's something really interesting uh, about Emerson Hall. It's got on it um, some inscriptions carved in stone. Now, one of them is very important for us in the philosophy department. Over the main entrance, it says, philosophy. And, and we love that because it means the administrators can't take that building away from us. That's <laughs> our building. Computer science is not going in there. So, <laughs> but over the side entrance, it says something else. And there's a story that goes along with what it says. The story is probably apocryphal, but I'm going to tell it to you anyway because it's interesting and it's related to the other object I want to show you. Uh, the story is this. In 1903 or 1904, when President Eliot, President Charles William Eliot, was, uh, was supervising the building of Emerson Hall, According to this story, he wrote to the most famous philosopher in the department, William James, and he said, well, we need uh, an inscription. We need something that's uh, inspiring, that people can read when they, when they cross into, through the portals of the, of the building. What do you recommend? And according to this story, James said, I can think of nothing better than the great saying by the pre-Socratic Greek philosopher Protagoras from the 6th century BCE, Man is the measure of all things. And if you think about this statement, man is the measure of all things, the way people usually think about it, it's, uh, it sort of makes us pretty important. Human beings, pretty important. Maybe even like the center of everything that is. People often think it involves a commitment to what's called a kind of subjectivism that puts human beings at the center of the universe. So according to the story, James proposed this inscription. And then in 1905, they had a big ceremonial opening of Emerson Hall. And they had the, they had the veil over the, over the stone. And President Eliot said, now take the veil down. And he took the veil down. And you can imagine William James turning white with anger or fear or misunderstanding or something when he read not an inscription from the Greek figure Protagoras, but instead a, a scripture, a, 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 um, a motto, a saying from, from the scriptures, from the Psalms, in fact. It says, from Psalm 8, it says, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And this seems to give the totally opposite story about what human beings are. We're so unworthy of the love of God that every time we experience ourselves as being loved by the ground of everything that is. We stand in awe before that experience. And I, th I think this story, even though it's probably apocryphal, is pretty amazing because sitting as we do at this point in history, in the end uh, of history, at this end of history, we have two cross-cutting heritages, two cross-cutting traditions. Typically, they're associated with Athens and Jerusalem. And they have this strong tension between them. 
And we're stuck in the middle of the crosshairs. On the one hand, it feels as though we're at the center of the universe. On the other hand, it feels as though we're so insignificant that it's amazing that anything in the universe cares about us at all. And it seems to me that we all deal with that, deal with the tension between those two sort of deeply felt experiences that we have as the result of having this cross-cutting heritage. Now this is a, probably an apocryphal story, uh, but as it turns out, we do have evidence that James loved this saying from Potagoras. When we, we were rooting, Eric and I were rooting around in the department offices with our former department administrator, Ruth Kolodny. We discovered that hiding in one of the filing cabinets somewhere was this beautiful loving cup, it's called. Wait, I have to find, uh, now you'll get to see if you can't see it. That's what it looks like. And this, it says, because we know because of the inscription on it, this was given by James's students to him upon his retirement in January of 1907. And if you look very closely, it says in Greek at the bottom there, uh, man is the measure of all things. It was, a, it was a motto that he really did love. So I think it's, I, what do I take from all this? What I take from all this is that living in the place that you do is really important. And it, I don't really mean to indicate that it matters that you live in this place, although I would of course love it if you were all here in the fall. But whatever place you live in, it seems to me what's really crucial is that you engage with it thoughtfully and intentionally. Pascal, this philosopher standing here, said something that I think is deep and important. He said, uh, the sole cause of human happy unhappiness is that people don't know how to stay quietly in a room. And I take this to mean that the mysteries of human existence are standing right before you, no matter where you are, no matter what place you're in, they're waiting for you to unravel them. But you have to attend to them. You have to pay attention to where you are. And that's a never-ending process, but it repays the effort anyway. As teachers at Harvard and as learners at Harvard, it seems to me that we are fortunate to be in a place that has such a long history of engagement with these kinds of human mysteries. And I'm grateful to be able to share the process of unraveling them with my students. Thank you.